Thank you, Pamela. Um, indeed, I am linked with the Global Burden of Disease Study and have been doing that kind of work for the last uh, 25 years. And somehow I became the to-go-to person for how you estimate uh, the burden of mental disorders. And along the way, it's, it's involved a little bit of convincing uh, uh, Chris Murray and Alan Lopez said uh, that, uh, yes, there is a problem there. And uh, you know, we may not know exactly how to measure it, but we know it is a big problem and it's a big problem everywhere. Um, let me introduce uh, the four panelists uh, in, uh, for this uh, session. And this, it's, it's a little cryptically titled, Managing Epidemics, the Role of Mental Health in Combating Communicable and Non-Communicable Diseases. Let me paraphrase it a little bit. I think the focus of this session will be on how do you use existing healthcare platforms for communicable disease, uh, for uh, non-communicable disease, uh, primary care settings uh, to deliver uh, mental health uh, uh, care. So the first panelist is Rachel Nugent. She's the Vice President of the Global Non-Communicable Diseases at uh, RTI International. And she has been working on global development for more than 30 years as a researcher, practitioner, and policy advisor to governments. We've interacted quite a bit uh, on cost-effectiveness uh, projects uh, in, uh, in the past. Second panelist is uh, Deepa Rao. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist, like my wife is, <laughs> or used to be. Uh, and she's an associate professor at uh, UW here uh, and an associate director of the Global Mental Health uh, and MPH uh, program. Uh, her professional interests are in implementing and disseminating effective behavioral interventions in non-psychiatry settings to improve mental health, reduce stigma, as was mentioned already, and to help people better engage uh, in the care. And then the third panelist is Dr. Lydia Trostiak. She's an associate professor in the UW uh, Department of uh, Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and assists with education and training efforts at the AIMS Center. And over the past decade, her research has uh, focused on improving the medical care and medical outcomes among individuals with serious uh, mental illness, such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And lastly, uh, Dr. Roman Shu. He is the Executive Deputy Director and Research Professor of Sun Yat-sen Global Health Institute at the uh, Sun Yat-sen uh, University. His research focuses on health system innovations and particularly those involving chronic diseases, health quality, and M health. So let me kick this off with asking Rachel to within the three minutes that you're allotted to give us a, a, a first stab at, uh, at this topic area. Thanks so much, Teo, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I did hear that you were invited to throw things at us if we go over time, so I'm going to try to be, speak really fast as fast as I can. Um, but I have uh, three things that I want to tell you about. I guess three minutes, three points, that's what I'll be doing here. And the first is to say a few words about non-communicable diseases, because um, it is something that has come into the global health scene relatively recently, even though the burden of non-communicable diseases has been very substantial globally and including in a number of developing countries for many decades. It's not a new problem, but it's a problem that has become much more obvious to us and we're more aware of it. But I wanna say a few words in particular because a lot of the wonderful uh, faculty and research and training and teaching that goes on at this university is in infectious diseases, not in non-communicable diseases in our global health work. And so there may be people who are less familiar with that. Um, NCDs, I, nobody likes the name, so we'll just, I, I get it, we'll set that aside. NCDs encompasses a lot of different chronic conditions, non-infectious chronic conditions, diabetes, heart disease, um, hypertension, cancers, et cetera. And um, it was not part of the MDG. So I'm gonna, my first point is to sort of frame NCDs in this sort of global health agenda. It was not part of the MDGs, as I think you heard earlier from Chris. Um, uh, but in 2011, thanks to the efforts of Professor UW Professor Ala Alwan, who was head of the NCD group at WHO at the time, 
in the early 2000s, convened a big meeting. Uh, the UN General Assembly had a meeting on NCDs in 2011, and it really brought NCDs to the forefront. And the, the community, small as it was at the time, said, look, this is a big problem. It's part of global health. It's happening in developing countries, and it has huge health and economic implications. That was a big, big step. And from that point, there has been a vastly, um, a vast increase in awareness and attention and uh, measurement and thinking about programming. So that's sort of the, the good news. Uh, as an example, the, a follow-on UN General Assembly meeting was held just three weeks ago in New York, heads of government, prime ministers, ministers, et cetera. And in comparison to the five events on NCDs that happened in 2011, and I was there and I had a lot of free time on my hands, I can tell you that, there were 89 events on NCDs a few weeks ago in New York. And, and many of them involved other communities in global health, communities that you all are involved in and many others, from refugees to maternal health to um, adolescents, et cetera. So it's really come onto the map. Um, mental health is a part of that. It had to fight a bit hard to become a part of that framing, but it's very much a part of it. And so now instead of a four by four that we used to speak about, we speak about a five by five because air quality has now been brought into the discussion as one of the major risk factors. So um, I, that's the good news. The not so good news is that that particular train is still moving very slowly, especially when it comes to funding programming. So the two other things I want to mention, one is that we did some work on integration. So I think a lot of what we're talking about is how do mental health get integrated into other health platforms forms and programming policies and so on. We did a, a paper this that was published in AIDS this past uh, April, July, and we looked at integrated programs, and of the uh, 896 abstracts that we gathered in our review, in our um, literature review, 12, we were looking at costs, sorry, I should have said this, I'm an economist, so it's always about the economics. We were looking at costs and cost effectiveness, 12 of them had costs that we could extract. Only one of those included mental health in the integrated programming. Um, and they were all just screening. So there really aren't examples um, that have come sort of to the attention literature of really integrated programs that include NCDs and, and or mental health. Mental health is part of NCDs or more broadly NCDs. So I will um, not say more about that, but we can talk about in the questions. Last thing I wanna mention on the good news side, I'm trying to go from sort of less good to very good news. <laughs> uh, we did do an investment case in Jamaica. One of the things that my team does is we're looking at economic policy benefits of these programs. And in Jamaica, they very much want mental health to be part of their integrated investment case. So when we did this, um, the components included were addressing depression and anxiety. And the two interventions were basic psych psychosocial and antidepressant uh, medication from less to more intensive depending on the, the case. And this is from the NH app that you heard about earlier from Chaker. So what we found was that the um, depression treatment, no, sorry, anxiety treatment had the second highest return on investment of all of the interventions that we looked at across NCDs um, for a, a 3.5 return on investment, three and a half dollars return for every dollar you spend on those interventions. And depression had the third highest. So after tobacco, those were better than the intervention cost benefit analysis that we got for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and alcohol interventions, which came as a surprise to us. And I will lastly, my final word, I know I'm probably out of time, more than out of time, is that I feel pretty, it was, it was, it was not um, deep modeling, but I feel pretty good about it because Deborah Kessel, who was at PAHO at the time, was the reviewer for that work and was very pleased with that work. She's now taking over as CEO. So we had a very good expert to tell us what we need to do. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me OK? OK. Um, so uh, let's see. Where to start? I don't see much in here. Because I can zoom to the back of the screen for two hours. And you don't want to have me doing that. But uh, um, I wanted to start off my remarks um, talking a little bit about my entree into global health. I trained as a clinical psychologist, but um, I spent a year 
at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore, India, and um, kind of went back to my roots and got to know my mother tongue again. And the really interesting observation I made that really, in a sense, launched my career in global health was at the time, and this was just before antiretrovirals uh, were available uh, for people living with HIV in India freely, um, there was a lot of stigma in private hospitals and it struck me as highly unusual that at a tertiary care facility like Nimhans where I was working, people with HIV were coming in for treatment um, of, at that time, just opportunistic infections. They weren't even treating you know, the virus. Um, and it struck me as, well, why was this that, you know, people with HIV are coming into a mental health facility for treatment? Well, it was the only place where they felt they could get care that was non-stigmatized. Um, and then, you know, from that experience on, I went back uh, to, uh, you know, my hometown of Chicago and uh, really started to look at how do we reduce stigma and how do we uh, you know, help people engage in treatments more. And since then, I've been kind of straddling different um, disciplines, platforms, um, working in stigma reduction, but working in integrated care models. Um, so what I want to focus a little bit on today is that my current work, um, along with a team of investigators in South Africa and here at the University of Washington and the University of Cape Town, uh, where we're scaling integrated mental health into public primary care facilities. Um, the origin of this work was to work in high prevalence HIV districts. So districts where um, we are working have prevalence of HIV around 40%, um, and which is you know, a striking figure. Um, and the um, intention of CDC, which funded our work, was to impact depress depressive symptoms mainly to help people engage in care better, to get them adhere to medications and uh, come in and show up for treatment. I just wanted to call out that the um, uh, former past uh, care and treatment uh, branch officer uh, is here, Tom Heller. Thanks for coming from South Africa. And um, so um, much of what the CDC funded, they had the foresight to really see that we can impact um, you know, how well people are doing in HIV if we intervene on mental health. Um, what we're doing is we're scaling this program. And uh, so you can imagine there's a lot of training involved, um, training and super, uh, supervision, but also service provision. Um, and uh, training and implementation science so we can try and understand if, if we're scaling appropriately based on language, based on regions, across contexts, cultures. Um, and I guess um, I know I got the one minute sign a second ago, but well, more than a second ago. But uh, uh, what I wanted to leave you with is just this parting thought that we know we have medications that work for helping to alleviate symptoms of depression. We have behavioral treatments that work. Um, really what we're fo focusing on with scaling is um, how do we adapt our training and mentorship methods to adequately respond to um, the issue in varying contexts. And also thinking about stockouts of medications, you know, that really it's not about the treatment itself and the effectiveness itself, but the, the process by which we can get uh, the treatments to people. But one of the biggest challenges we have that was mentioned um, throughout these presentations is stigma. Um, and the really interesting thing that I wanted to say is that we've grown over the last 10 years. When I first started at the University of Washington, I attended a panel um, that was launching the AIDS Sutra book that was commissioned by Gates. And um, people were throwing their hands up. What can we do? It's stigma. We can't do anything, whether it's HIV, mental health, um, et cetera. And at that time, I mean, I was just learning about some of these uh, interventions, but we have interventions that we can use to reduce stigma. It's, it's, um, there is a frustration that we think that we can just educate people and then stigma will go away. It takes more than education. You have to affect ingrown attitudes that take a while to develop. And how do you do that? You do that with contact. You get people together. You get people working together on a common goal. Um, we also have in the audience Suhardha Rai from Nepal, who's working with uh, Brandon Court at Transcultural um, Psych Psychological Association, organization, excuse me, TPO. And they have um, started to test a photo voice intervention that has helped bringing people together, healthcare workers and people with mental illnesses. Um, and they've noticed when they put this as an adjunct to some of our integrated care models, 
not only um, will they eventually understand the cost of such an adjunct and how much stigma is reduced, but they're finding that case detection is higher from the healthcare workers that are trained in these stigma reduction models and that the people engage in care better. So we do have methods um, not only to reduce uh, you know, symptoms of depression, but also the stigma that accompanies it. Thanks. Uh, it's an honor to be on this panel. Uh, I'd like to discuss a little bit about uh, universal health coverage. As a universal health coverage it will not be realized with the universal health coverage for mental diseases. Uh, but what are the examples in the world for that? Actually, in China, since 2004, the government has started a program called 686 program, uh, which so far has covered more than 5 million uh, people with psychosis and other severe mental disorders. And the program is actually uh, uh, available for any people with one of the 8 or 7 uh, severe mental disorders uh, to a large extent for free. So to that extent, the China has achieved universal health coverage for severe mental disorders. But this program, surprisingly, has led to very little international attention. Uh, we've saw no more than 10 international publications on uh, this program. What are the essential uh, objective of the program? That's in 2004, uh, China, uh, shortly before that, experienced a SARS. And the outbreak of SARS has led to many changes in China's health system. And one of the changes, uh, uh, among other elements as uh, drivers, the government began to pilot this 66 program. One of the motivation is uh, uh, severe shortage of mental health personnel in China, uh, professionals, and uh, over concentration of care in mental health facilities. So the program is trying to move patients from hospitals to community-based care with task shifting and uh, relatively uh, trained professionals. The key program components including mass training of internists and converting those internists into psychiatrists. Of course, they are not psychiatrists by the Western and uh, American standard, but at least they provide some cadre of professional who can deal with some of the most severe mental disorders. The second component is uh, the development of the national electronic registry for people with severe mental disorders. Uh, in theory, this registry captures everybody with psychosis and other mental disorders. And the people are offered a written consent. If they sign that consent, they will be signed into this 686 uh, program. What is the service model? The service model is uh, the so-called psychiatrist we will diagnose and prescribe treatment plan. Then the mental health administrator, who are normally living in the same neighborhood of those people uh, in the townships, are, those people are the uh, staff of the township health centers. They are supposed to work with the village doctors. Village doctors are not the true doctors. They are more of the paramedics or something like that. So the mental health administrator and most of them are trained in a public health degree, working with the village doctors in taking care of the uh, patient, working very closely with the family members. Sometimes in some regions, the family members are given a financial reward if they uh, provide a certain level of service to the patient in their family. So they are given like uh, $20 per month uh, for, for their service they are, if they are recognized by the mental health administrator. And there is a full uh, follow-ups uh, from those health professionals, home visits. There are free medications for people who are eligible if their uh, uh, salary uh, uh, income below certain uh, standard. So that's a simple program uh, with relatively little uh, financial input, but seems working uh, from the face validity. However, unfortunately, uh, despite uh, many efforts we have not yet been able to conduct a scientific uh, evaluation of the program, even though the program has been in place for more than 10 years, but we are keep on trying. 
uh, but we hope those programs can give some implication for other low-income settings. Thank you. Great, good afternoon, and thanks, Pamela, for inviting me to participate in this panel for this really important discussion. Um, I just want to pick up where Teo uh, left off, just talking about a specific strategy when we think about how can we increase access to effective mental health treatment. This spe one specific recommendation is to leverage the infrastructure that uh, exists for treatment of, of NCDs like diabetes. And uh, we talked a little bit yesterday, for those who were here uh, were at the session yesterday, about a research study that we're doing in India right now to, to use an integrated care model uh, to treat diabetes and depression in, in four diabetes clinics in India. And this just, just makes a lot of sense when you think about there's not very much money to spend for mental health treatment. Um, it's just a very efficient use of resources when, that when you consider that people who have diabetes and other NCDs have very high rates of uh, depression and other behavioral health disorders. So like one in five people uh, also ha who have diabetes also have depression. So making mental health treatment services available to places where they're coming to get their diabetes treatment just makes, just makes a lot of sense pragmatically. Um, so at the end of the, the session yesterday, we had this really interesting discussion about our communication strategy and, and marketing. How do we tailor messages um, to, to state specific stakeholders? And it got me thinking about why should diabetes treatment settings want to integrate mental health care? Why, you know, what, what's in it for them? And I think the answer is really um, that what we're really proposing to do when we integrate care in this way is to address a critically important problem about the increasing burden of comorbidity, which is a, a very large and very costly problem around the world and is actually getting larger. And so when it's just to be really concrete and specific, in the US there are 326 million people and 42% of us have a chronic medical condition. So, um, so of, the 40, uh, of this 145 million people who have a chronic uh, medical condition, more than half um, have two or more chronic conditions. And, and when you think about people over 65, that's 75%. So, um, and studies have shown that uh, less than half of people who have more than one chronic condition uh, receive appropriate care. And the issue is that all of our treatments are fo focused on single diseases. And the same thing with treatment guidelines. So when a, when a patient comes to us that has multiple conditions, we have conflicting um, we have challenges about which to pay attention, which guidelines to pay attention, which treatment to offer. And mental health comes into this mix because um, when we think of these 70 million people who have more than one chronic condition, more than half of them have depression or another behavioral health disorder. And the impact of depression on uh, diabetes, for example, is just devastating. People are unable to care for their illnesses, costly, they have increased complications, they have increased mortality. So the, I mentioned the team care study yesterday. For the, those of you who don't know, it was a study that was done, it was a clinical trial done in the US that brought collaborative care into primary care. And it was a, the treatment itself was a multidisciplinary team that worked together in a primary care clinic to treat diabetes and depression at the same time. And what this trial showed is that doing this, having a team work together to address multiple conditions at the same time can improve outcomes for both conditions. And we're, we're hoping to replicate this. This is the independent study. We're hoping to replicate this in diabetes clinics in India. And what struck me in terms of, you know, sort of getting back to the messaging is that in, in our research studies and in implementation work that we do through the AIM Center and even in clinical work, when, when we approach diabetes physicians and ask them to screen for depression and treat depression with Within diabetes clinical settings, we, of, we often get this pushback about, oh, if we screen, we're going to find depression and then we're going to be overwhelmed with treating it. Like, what are we going to do when we find all of this depression? And the way that we reassure clinical providers is to say, you know, hey, these are your patients who you're already treating for diabetes. They're coming to you, they're getting diabetes care from you. And, um, and many of them are not doing well because they have untreated depression or psychosis or uh, substance use disorder. And we're here to provide you with strategies and tools uh, to treat them more effectively to, and to help support them to manage their own illnesses more effectively. And I think um, the same arguments we could make uh, to organizations, to systems, and even to governments is that we need to recommend that healthcare systems move away from this single disease framework to thinking about managing the reality of this, uh, multiple diseases at the same time, the reality of this complex comorbidity. And we also want to think about healthcare payment mechanisms, focusing on improving outcomes and not just counting the services that are, that are being provided. 
Uh, I thank the panel for giving us some interesting examples ranging from small initiatives that often get researched very well, that probably get written up, to very large scale up of services, where the opposite is the, is the case that it is uh, poorly documented, few people know about it, but uh, is a fantastic uh, example of, uh, of a, a extreme case of, uh, of scaling up uh, uh, services for people with, uh, with uh, mental disorders. Um, I now open the floor to people to ask questions about this topic of how can we provide mental health services integrated uh, with, uh, with other uh, platforms of, uh, of healthcare uh, provision, uh, any examples that people may have or you know, pros and cons of trying to leverage off other parts of the health system. Uh, or even thinking, which we haven't touched upon, about you know ven venues of care that bypass the health system through e-health uh, applications, uh, apps, and the, the thing that was mentioned in the previous panel, um, you know, teaching basic skills derived from cognitive behavioral therapy to every youngster, because these are like life skills. So. Let me ask if people want to come up to the microphone and ask uh, questions uh, to the panel. Thank you. Um, my name is Sunny Chen. I'm a assistant professor in nursing at the University of Washington, Tacoma. And I was a, a registered nurse working in psychiatry, psychiatry unit. And um, no matter what kind of disease it is, um, I think there's one burden that's very direct and challenging, which is caregiving burden. And I brought up caregivers because no matter um, um, uh, because research has already shown that uh, engaging families is the key to um, in sustaining those effective treatment for people with mental illness. And since sustainable development is one of the focus of this forum, I was wondering if the expert panel can comment on how we can better support caregivers as well as reducing their caregiving burden. Thank you. Uh, th this is actually a very important element when the Chinese uh, are designing the community-based mental program because um, I, I do not have the national statistics, but for the area where I'm conducting my own research in Liuyang, which has a population of 1.5 million people, uh, for the study population with people with psychosis, more than 95% of them are living in the family. I heard in USA, many of them are living in the streets, but in, in China, many do live with the family. So how to mobilize and give incentives for the family to take care of them is not only uh, have better care, but to save lots of uh, societal resources in providing care, because they naturally have uh, incentive to take good care of their own relatives. Uh, so Chinese government uh, and health agencies are experimenting all sorts of uh, innovations of uh, encouraging uh, those uh, uh, family caregivers, uh, such as uh, uh, what I've just is described as giving cash award to uh, family members who have performed certain functions defined by the government uh, as a care, like uh, if they come for the regular uh, medication events, they come to take the medicine for their family members, do they report a relapse, et cetera, et cetera. They have a manual for that in some uh, cities. But another issue they have described is uh, how to reduce the burden of family members. Uh, our own research are actually working on that. Uh, we are trying to use some very simple technology to aid the family members and the patients uh, unfortunately, uh, it seems to me is that now uh, researchers and uh, uh, other people are more fashionable to looking for more high-end, more sophisticated technology in combating mental disorders. But in reality, in the rural population we are working with, uh, they can only deal with the, the most reliable and the simple technology we can provide. 
Autism may look very fancy and uh, very functional, but uh, people have a big challenge of using them. So for us, we are still rely on text messaging because it's more reliable and very simple. We keep to the simplest formats of using text messaging to educating family members, linking them with the mental health administrators and village doctors, sending them from time to time relapse checklist. So if they find any signs of relapse, they report through text messaging to the mental health system. Then we use them to schedule appointments with psychiatrists within the system. So we do some simple methods, very simple, to help them trying to reduce their burden in taking care of their family members. I actually think that Mike should go to Lydia because uh, she and I worked on, a, on this project she's mentioned on depression and diabetes. And um, some of the formative work we did pointed to the importance of including family in the treatment. Um, so maybe... Well, actually, you want to Take the mic, uh, please. Hmm? Oh, uh, speak in the mic. Uh, oh, I don't know if people heard me. Yeah, what? So, um, <laughs> well, I'll let Deepa uh, respond to, but I um, was actually thinking of something different than the independent study. So, Sunny, thanks for your, your question. I'm, I'm glad that you asked it. And I wanted to think more broadly about the involvement of families in this care and not just reducing the, the caregiver burden on them. And it made me think of a really innovative treatment for diabetes uh, program that's in, Cam that's in Cambodia. It's conducted by an NGO called Mopo Cho, where it's actually where the diabetes treatment itself is largely conducted through these peer network. And so people who live in communities, you know, in their own uh, largely impo uh, impoverished settings, impoverished communities, people who are living with diabetes are trained to be these peer educators. And most of the care, they, they go literally door to door and screen people for diabetes. And um, when they identify people, they uh, refer them for treatment. But most of the treatment is done within the homes of uh, individuals' homes and the homes of these peer educators within the communities. And they've just started this screening program to see whether the community health workers can uh, screen and identify depression within this context. And it's a really fantastic opportunity to think about how little time people spend in clinical settings and bringing the treatment outside of, outside of clinical settings. Um, just the, the thing, the point that I would add on to it is just how um, you know, bringing caregivers into treatment has looked in India with the uh, independent study. Um, what we ultimately did was we encouraged and, and it, actually I think this care came from our care managers that they themselves um, didn't really see the point in just treating the individual, but, you know, bringing uh, the caregivers into the, into the treatment by, you know, calling the family members if needed and, you know, asking certain questions, how, enlisting their help in taking care of, of the patient. I think you're talking about something slightly different though in that there is a burden on the caregivers, right? And, and how do we um, support them in uh, their treatment of the individual, right? And I think um, that, I don't know if any of us have addressed that, other maybe than Roman with them. But I mean, you know, in the US we have support groups for caregivers and perhaps um, bringing people together is kind of the answer, so. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Sarah Belkamp, and I am a communications professional, very interested in behavioral health uh, and stigma related to behavioral health and communication strategies that can break down that stigma. So I'm very interested in the conversation and dialogue you had with messaging and how to, you know, hit different groups and different target audiences. But I also am interested in, I know a lot about contact education and how, you know, face to face interaction with people that are dealing or experiencing mental health challenges is helpful. Have you seen anything that's been done or scaled up online that has been um, effective? I know you talked a little bit about a, a program that you were working on, Deepa. Um, that's my question. Any online stigma reduction that's been super effective that you have seen or moderately effective? <laughs> Um, I know that there are some ongoing studies of um, in the U.S. and in Sweden um, with chat rooms and trying to see if perhaps online groups in this manner can help to be a source of support. Um, I haven't seen the final data on those studies yet. The, the domestic study I'm thinking of is one that relates to HIV stigma. And um, 
and actually as well in um, through Karolinska Institute. Um, Lars Erickson has been engaged in studies on stigma reduction. Um, so I, I haven't seen the results of them yet. I just um, worked with uh, Jane Simone. I don't know if she's here um, in the back. I will, maybe in the back, I don't know. <laughs> um, and we are, um, we've just um, kind of gotten accepted a series on e-learning um, in HIV and that are behavioral um, treatments that we could use. And um, there's a short piece that I wrote with um, Megan Ramaya, who is in the back, <laughs> uh, where we kind of explore this issue that there's a lot of, there's tremendous potential for using the internet, um, you know, as the source of, uh, or stigma reduction intervention. However, there, we need to also consider, I mean, how many of you in the room want to throw your phone across the room because it's causing you so much stress? So there's this kind of double-edged sword is, um, do I want to keep looking at the monitor on my phone? Or, But I think it can be a tremendous potential for people who are isolated, have no other way of reaching out, um, and that it could potentially be a, a first step into having in-person contact. So that's kind of what we wrote in the piece that will be coming out in current HIV AIDS reports very soon. Yeah, I think I'll just, I'll just second that. Um, I haven't really, hadn't really thought of it in terms of stigma, per, reducing stigma per se, but I was just at the um, International Conference for Early uh, Psychiatric Intervention in Boston. And there's a real effort internationally to, to um, identify um, uh, mental illness in kids, youth and young adults early, um, because we know that the longer people live with symptoms, the, 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 the poorer their outcomes are. And so there's some really fascinating work looking at, um, you know, getting people to seek treatment, to, to reach out either for treatment or just to connect other people, not become socially isolated. And so really interesting experiments going on. Um, um, uh, projects going on between uh, you know, sort of Facebook and, and, and investigative groups kind of looking at being able to just just uh, post ads like if you're people are, are googling I'm happy you know I'm hearing voices to just say you know here's a link to an early intervention treatment program and just really trying to think about is it lack of knowledge or is it stigma or both that keeps people from from reaching out and, and trying to leverage social media that way. It's almost like what ISIS had did to reach out to people in terms of, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but in a good, in a, in a therapeutic way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I wanted to thank all the panelists, both your, this panel and the earlier panel, for your in depth discussion. My name is Tom Heller. As, as Deepa mentioned, I, I worked for CDC for the last several years. Um, I've been in three countries in South Africa, Ethiopia, and Cambodia. And in all of those countries, one of our tasks uh, at CDC was to go around to many, many facilities um, to, to see the quality of care, specifically of HIV care. But one thing that was true across those three countries, the public health facilities would have 200 or more patients there first thing in the morning and the places were, uh, they, they were done with their work by 2 or 2.30 in the afternoon. And so there's a very, you know, and these are providers who are seeing patients at enormously fast rates. And I, want, I wonder if you've contended with that challenge in terms of using those public health platforms for identifying mental health issues. Uh, uh, and just as a corollary, in two of those countries, um, there was a very uh, strong emphasis on community health workers, on, on getting high school graduates to be, serve, to be um, barefoot doctors, more or less, uh, in, in their communities, and where they would be responsible for the health, the health of a small number of people. And there were thousands of these community health workers and whether that's a, a, whether we can really count on these public health facilities for identifying uh, comorbidities, specifically mental illness, and whether any effort is being made to sort of um, uh, sensitize community health workers to uh, to identify those pe people, and and I'd also appreciate hearing from uh, the representative from. 
Kenya and from the Carter uh, Carter Foundation uh, uh, f for the experience in Liberia and and in Kenya because I don't I haven't been to those countries to know whether really you can count on getting them if you're suicidal and you go to a public health facility what's the chances of getting getting attention mm -hmm. thanks um, I swear that Tom is not a plant in the audience, uh, but I, I, I'll just say something really briefly and that um, you will be happy and maybe proud to know that the work that we're doing as part of MINT, Mental Health Integration in South Africa, is utilizing the fact that um, there are long wait times in the primary care facilities, the public facilities. Um, what they do as part of the program or the package that we've been calling it is they have um, uh, adherence counselors give morning talks um, and to sensitize people who are waiting around issues of um, depression, anxiety, alcohol use disorders, sensitizes them so that when they see the nurse, the nurse is trained to detect these common mental disorders and then refer to the um, adherence counselor who we're training in basic counseling techniques and evidence-based, um, you know, South African adapted tools to relieve depression and anxiety um, and boost adherence um, to medications. Um, and then uh, I know you've just recently left. Um, the push for the future is actually um, to train community healthcare workers um, as part of initiatives that you've begun um, in uh, using the brief mental health screener in community settings. So people going out into the community and able to screen and then, uh, but before that happens, the, um, there is a strengthening of the referral network and system so that everyone's aware of the resources available in the districts where they can refer people who screen positive for common mental disorders. So that is ongoing in South Africa. I don't know about other places and perhaps maybe Roman, you could talk a little bit about that. Um, the, the the Chinese uh, community-based uh, mental health program uh, utilizing a lot of the public health uh, resources. So um, for entire China, the government give overall program structures. But within those overall program structures, the localities can adapt uh, the details to meet the local context. So I'm most familiar with uh, Liu Yang, where my project site is. So in this site, the psychiatrist, again, those are internist, converted psychiatrists, for every two months, they travel in the van with two nurses and then one pharmacist to uh, townships on this specified date. And this date will never change year to year. So if it is January 1st to Township A, they always go there on January 1st. Even if January 1st happened to be the new year, they still go, regardless. So the purpose is to people can remember uh, what is the time they come. When they go, they station in the Township Health Center. Then the health uh, uh, village doctors will call these people and all the people come in the morning uh, of the day of their arrival. So you will have 100 or 70 or 80 uh, people with psychosis came in the same morning for checkups and for uh, antipsychotic prescription. There's no privacy. Uh, everybody in one room. So when I'm seeing one patient, other patients and the families are watching. Every person get probably one to two minutes with the psychiatrist. So that's a reality. But when looking at this, uh, the quality issue is whether we provide suboptimal quality mental health care or no care. That's a challenge the government and the people are struggling with. Yeah, it's good to hear these, uh, these comments uh, from uh, within health services. I also very well remember having funnels of 50 to 100 people in front of a consultation room in small hospitals in Lesotho and Zimbabwe, where I worked for 10 years, and you know, trying to handle that volume of, uh, of care uh, means that yeah, you have to really pick and choose what, uh, what you can pick up. Rachel, you wanted to 
just briefly, uh, Tom, you might be aware of this example, but in case others aren't in Rwanda, they ha have a very successful community health worker model that uh, covers all of the sort of usual care that one would expect in a primary health care model that is fully scaled up. But they last year began to train community health workers specifically on mental health. Not the same country, a new country of people who would be mental health community health workers. And I had the opportunity to sit in on some of their training. They're trained for two years. So they, they get training, they go out and begin to see, go to the households and, and develop their caseload. I won't remember exactly, but I think they had 60 households each that they were going to try to cover. And it was a very extensive training. And because they have a long history and experience with community health workers, it was, um, you know, I don't, I don't have any results to mention, but I think it was very encouraging to see that they were building on a success story and moving into mental health in a quite serious way. Yeah, there's, there's actually a fantastic picture from maybe four or five years ago where the president of Rwanda invited all the community health workers in the country. And so they filled 60,000 seats in the, in the national stadium and uh, they all had the same uh, t-shirts. It's uh, pretty impressive. Um, we are almost out of time, so maybe a, a very brief question. Uh, Okay, to finish so, up. So thanks for being here. Thanks for all the hard, the great work that you're doing. My name is Yanni. I'm a medical student here at the University of Washington. So my question is kind of related to what Deepa was saying, that it's really, it can be really, really hard to change attitudes. And so, you know, I'm, as a medical student, I'm really hopeful that there's, you know, all this discussion about mental health, the discussion about, you know, addiction treatment, substance use treatment. And yet at the same time, I'm still hearing um, community doctors saying, you know, they don't want to provide those kind of services. They don't want to be seen as that type of clinic. So I'm just wondering, can you share maybe short examples of challenges and successes of how to deal with people with a lot of power relatively and also policymakers to really change these attitudes sounds that like a very long question <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anyone anybody want to at least give a short answer we can talk later <laughs> she's one of my mpa students but um i don't know lydia do you want to tackle this i mean the reason I look well, at you is because it touches on stigma, not just uh, in the general population, but among healthcare workers yeah. as well. Uh, you know, I, I think I, I think it is. It's about you know just thinking about buy-in for for any kind of adoption or sustainment of anything you're trying, any kind of change you're trying to do. That there has to be buy-in, including from leadership. You know, will absolutely torpedo any effort to try to to start a new program if there's not buy-in. Yeah, um, I, I, the reason why I looked at you is because um, we, we encountered this in the independent study. We had um, diabetes clinicians who said, I don't want to treat mental health issues here. I don't want my clinic, this is a quote from the qualitative work, I don't want my clinic to be known as the you know, clinic that treats people with serious mental illness or something along those lines. Um, and I think that what ended up happening was we just proceeded with the work and people started to understand how important it was and started to see the improvements that their um, patients were making as a result of mm -hmm. the work. And, and we didn't hear much more about that from the leadership and the healthcare workers and the physicians that we were working with. Um, the, the, I don't know if you were here when I made reference to Saharda Rai's work uh, with Brandon Court. He's right there. I would encourage you to talk to him afterwards and he can tell you a little bit about the work they're doing in Nepal which is having amazing findings. And um, you know, what I was really impressed with is to note that they're actually taking costing um, measurements to try to see if, you know, if it's you know, very minimal effort is involved and minimal costs are involved where you can bring this as an adjunct to your integrated care programs. Thank you, Deepa, and, and other members uh, of the panel. Uh, we'll conclude uh, with this. Thank you.